รับสัญญาณอืม Today is the first Sunday of Advent. You can see our candles almost gone, so we're gonna put it out before we burn up the thing, the wreath. Wreath. Thank you. So first Sunday of Advent. Keep that in mind, and I would like to ask for a volunteer to read Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. And I would like for you to come up to a microphone and do that. We're going to read that. That's not part of the message today, but it is part of Advent. I'm not quite sure why, but we're going to do it because we've. Jim, come on up. Thank you. Come on up, please. Thank you for volunteering. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. The Lord had said to Abram, "Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse." And all, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was seventy-five years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram travelled through the land as far as the site. Of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, "To your offspring I will give this land." So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord. And called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Thank you. Abraham, Abram and Sarah received God's promise of blessing late in life. Well past the age of childbearing, they received a promise of children and land. They responded by leaving everything to follow God's call. The miraculous birth of their child pointed to another miraculous birth centuries later. Are we open to God's call, or have we set up barriers that prevent us from receiving a blessing? And today's candle actually is representative of the candle of call. The day that we're celebrating is the first Sunday in Advent, which is the day of call. And um, we ask that we ask God that our hearts will be open to listen to His call. Okay, thank you for reading that. Well, I'd like for everybody to stand. Let's all stand. We just sat down, but let's stand. Um, we're going to introduce. Let the new folks introduce themselves if if they're willing, and if they're not, we'll ask them to introduce themselves anyway. But got a lot of choice, uh, but um, I don't know the two young ladies in the back. Does anybody know them? If not, uh, no. Please tell us who you are and where you're from. Hello. Yeah, right there where you're at. Okay, thank you. She just came here today. She's uh, she heard that 
we existed here. We were here, and she just wanted to come see. We are. She's from Hiroshima. Okay. All right. Welcome. She's from Sendamatsu in Hiroshima. All right. Hang out with those two, huh? I didn't know you guys had friends. Oh, sorry. Okay, let's get a handshake or a hug and get ready to say. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't know the first time. Jean? Eugene, welcome. Sorry, I, I missed you there. It's didn't know if you had been here before. So. Welcome. All right. Welcome. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Let's get those handshakes and those hugs. No, I, I, I like, yeah, it gets in my eye. As you find your seat, if there's someone who might need an interpreter, uh, please assist them. Uh, maybe have them sit a little closer to the front. And if you can interpret for anybody out there, please do so. All right. Let's uh, get ready to look at the word. There we go. Today we're going to read quite a, a long passage of scripture. We're going to read for first just one verse from Acts chapter 1, and then we're going to read from Acts chapter 2, about half of that chapter. So please bear with me. Acts chapter 1 is when we're going to look at one scripture, and it's Jesus speaking. Verse 8, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then Jesus was taken away into the clouds, and the disciples went to hang out in a room for a few days and pray and read scripture. And then we go to verse 1 of chapter 2. And I'm going to read all the way through verse 24. Right. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. 
When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, oops, did I miss something? Uh, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and con converts to Judaism, Cretans and Ar Arabs. We hear them declaring the word wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Verse 14, then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out of my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep his hold on him. And we could read and read and read Peter's wonderful sermon, but we're going to stop right there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, open up our hearts to receive your word. Change our lives to thee, Lord. Glorify your name in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. Peter was a different man here. God makes the person before he sends the message. What happened to Peter is what we're going to look at today. We're going to see a change in Peter and we're going to try to figure out what happened. Why was he cho so changed? How did he change? What did he do after this change took place? Sometimes the preparation of the messenger takes a lot longer than we expect, than we hope. We want to do things for God right now, but sometimes it takes some time. Let's look at the change in Peter's life once he was filled with the Holy Spirit. In verse 14, we, say, we can see that after Peter left the room, after the Holy Spirit came into the room and filled the 120 believers, Peter left the room and he did something. He stood up. He stood up with the 11 other disciples and he addressed the crowd. He raised his voice and he addressed the crowd. Well, was this always Peter's character? First of all, he stood up. He did something. He was no longer the scared, hiding, cowering Peter. What happened to him? And when we look at these two words, stood up, does it just mean he was in a seated position and he got up to his feet? No, not at all. Peter took a stand is what this means. Now, was this the Peter? We know this is the same Peter we're talking about in the New Testament, in the Gospels. Well, let's take a look. Had he always been like this? We find Peter sinking in one place, right? 
Jesus was out on, on the lake one night walking on the water and he says, Peter, come here! And Peter gets out and walks on the water a few steps and then takes his eyes off of Jesus and what happens? The scripture says that he actually began to sink because he lost his nerve. Now this same Peter who lost his nerve with Jesus standing right there in front of him is now standing up in front of thousands of people at a large festival in Jerusalem shouting, taking a stand for Jesus Christ. Now, why were they in this upper room? There were a few reasons they were in this room. Well, of course, Jesus told them to go there and wait. But probably they were not too comfortable wondering if at any time the authorities would break in and arrest them all for being followers of Jesus. It wasn't too many weeks prior that this was the case. Now Jesus had risen from the grave and they had hung out with Jesus for about 40 days and then about 10 days or so have passed but they're up in this room and suddenly the wind and the fire and the speaking in another language and Peter is changed. Let's look at something else about Peter. Peter was second guessing Jesus. Peter slept when Jesus asked him to hang out and pray. I'm going to go over there and pray. You guys stay here. Peter fell asleep. Jesus said, Simon Peter, you went to sleep on me. Can't you stick it out for a little bit longer, Peter? He fell asleep. Peter was a... Uh, Instead of trusting Jesus to take care of a situation, he reached out and grabbed his sword and cut off the servant, servant's ear. Peter was violent. He was apprehensive. And then we know that Peter was slinking away from Jesus. Snuck away from the other disciples when the crowds came to arrest Jesus, what did Peter say just before he snuck away? If all of these other disciples turn against you, I won't, Jesus. You can count on me. And as soon as they came to arrest Jesus, who was the first one down the road? Peter. That's the same guy. Same Peter. It's not second Peter. This is Peter. Same guy. Right? And not only did he run away, he went over and warmed himself by the fire, looking over his shoulder. And some little girl goes, I know you. You're with those disciples. You're one of his disciples. And Peter begins to curse his friends and his Savior. That same Peter is the guy we're talking about. Verse 17 says, Peter stood up. Not only did he just stand up, he stood up with these 11 that he was cursed, that he didn't want to have any part of. He stood up. Why was he able to do that? What happened to Peter? Peter was filled with the Holy, Holy Spirit and changed. Is there something in this infilling of the Holy Spirit that we as Christians need to look at carefully? Can that change take place in our life? Can we be filled with the Holy Spirit today? The Bible tells us and talks about the infilling of the Holy Spirit throughout the book of Acts, throughout the New Testament. Paul talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit in several places. Well, let's take a look at something else. Remember, Peter was cursing his friends. Now... He's standing for God. Let me tell you a story. I don't know if all of you understand American football, but there's a, your opponent's goal and your goal. If you run toward the right goal, you can score six points. If you run the other way, it's bad. It's really bad. There's a story about a fellow named Roy Regals. Roy Regals, in the 1929 Rose Bowl, picked up a loose football 
his opponent had the ball, he picked it up and he started running with all his might. He ran about 75 yards for his own goal line. His teammate finally tackled him one foot short of the goal line. Regal was so disappointed at halftime, he just sat in the corner of, a locker, of the locker room not talking to any of his fellow players. But the coach walked up to him and said, Roy, when we go back out on the field in the second half, I want you to go out there just like nothing had ever happened. The game is only half over. How often does the failure of somebody like Roy and Peter describe you and I? <laughs> Have we run toward the wrong goal? Have we denied Christ? Have we denied our Christian friends? Yeah. And what does Jesus say to us? Get up. Go back out on the field. The game is only half over. Don't worry about it. Let's go. Let's start anew. That's the gospel of God's grace. He uses unworthy people like us. Aren't you glad he uses people that aren't perfect? Aren't you glad he reached down and touched you? Aren't you glad he wants to fill you with his Holy Spirit today? Behind every word that's spoken for Jesus is the life of the believer. Our message about Christ will never be full of the Holy Spirit more than our lives are full of the Holy Spirit, right? If we are full of the Holy Spirit, then our message will be full of the Holy Spirit. If we're living for Jesus in a full way, we'll be able to speak forth in powerful ways, as Peter did. That's just the fact of the matter. Peter doesn't stand up to preach out of an empty relationship with God. What, he had, what had he just done? He had denied Christ, right? And he denied him three times. And Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And then he spent 40 wonderful days with Jesus. And then he spent 10 days after Jesus went back to heaven in a room with other believers, praying and worshiping and probably reading scripture. So, what happened? A few hours of being filled with the Holy Spirit and praying and fellowshipping changed Peter. He was overwhelmed by the Spirit. I pray that all of us would stand up to tell others about Jesus after we've spent so much precious time with God like that. You want to get with other believers and pray? You want to get with other believers and fellowship and worship? Your encounter will be very special. And your message will be filled with the power of God. Now Peter stood up, and it says in verse 17, with the eleven. Um, why didn't he stand up by himself? Why didn't he stand up by himself? He says he, the Holy Spirit made it a point to leave this part of the verse in the Bible to teach us a lesson, I believe. It's the beginning of the whole New Testament that teaches that Christianity is not a religion, not a relationship for individuals. Peter is out there with the other disciples and the other believers on the street. And they're praising God. They're worshiping God. Right? And what are, what are they doing? They're singing the praises. They're probably reading Psalms 150 or reciting it from memory. God is great. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And he's out there with the other disciples. All of the disciples and all of those believers could have preached the same sermon that Peter preached. Sometimes in our desire to be individuals, well, that's the way I am. That's me. That's how I do it. Sometimes we neglect fellowship, the fellowship that we so desperately need. Well, I'm an individual. I'm going to be who I am. If I hang out you know, with all of them, I'm going to lose my individual nature. You know, Jesus never told Peter to go off and be by himself. Peter, you go and hide up in the corner somewhere, find your own room, stay by yourself, and I'll come and fill you there. He didn't do that. The Holy Spirit came into that room where there were 120 believers and filled them all. 
They were together there. So when they went out on the street, Jesus commissioned Peter to go out and speak forth with the eleven. Let me tell you, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you will want to be around other believers. You will naturally want a fellowship with other believers. You'll want to go to mountain worship with other believers. You'll want to come to church and rub elbows and, and sing the praises with other people. You'll want to go to Fernando's restaurant with other believers. <laughs> go there sometime. And you, you never see one of us there. Right? It's very rare when you get to just one of us. Why do we go there in groups? Because we want to be together. <laughs> we want to grow together. We want to live together. As you live in Christ, you'll naturally want to be around other believers. You'll be calling your believers, your brothers and sisters. You'll be emailing them. You'll be sending them faxes. It's just the way God wants it to be. When you're full of the Holy Spirit, you'll run away from your brothers and sisters. You run toward them. You can't stay away from each other. That's just the way it is. That's what being full of the Holy Spirit does for you. Now, there's nothing wrong with a desire to spend some time alone with God. The scripture teaches us to do that. That's very important. We should have that time. The more you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the more you'll find that fellowship is important to you. It's a natural response to being filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's look at that verse again, verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven and he raised his voice. Now, Christians who are filled with the Holy Spirit just do that kind of stuff. We are loud. <laughs> we are rambunctious. Now, Peter, you might read this and say, well, in those days they didn't have a radio mic. Right? So he had to shout. It was noisy. It was a festival. They had to talk loud. Peter had to shout. Well, I don't know. That's the only reason. It's just a practical matter. Thousands of people there. I think the raising of the Christian's voice also represents passion. I think it, that spirit-filled Christians just want to talk loud and they want to sing loud. We sing the song, shout to the Lord. Right? We'll just want to. Now, there's a danger in just being noisy for the sake of being noisy. Uh, an old, old preacher. I mean, this guy was old. He wrote this. If you have lightning, you can afford to thunder. But don't try to thunder out of an empty cloud. In other words, don't be loud just for being loud's sake. That's not what I'm saying. But if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, ask God to fill you. And you'll be filled. And when he does, let loose. Go ahead and shout to the Lord. Shout to the masses. Raise your voice to God. Shout to the whole world the salvation story. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you can't help but shout the salvation story. Look, at that's what Peter did. It's the natural response to being filled with the Holy Spirit. And the next part of this verse, we see that Peter addressed the crowd. I think this means that he connected with his audience. Look at what he says in verse... In the remainder of the verse, he addressed the crowd, fellow Jews, and all of you living in Jerusalem. I'm from Jerusalem. I'm a Jew. Hey, listen to me. Right, right, right away, Peter began to connect with the audience. Right? He began with what they were interested in. Right? The audience was concerned about the behavior of these 120 knuckleheads. What are they doing? They're shouting in the streets. They've probably got their hands in the air. They're praising God. They've got tears flowing, maybe. And half or more of the crowd can't understand what they're doing, what they're saying. You ever been in a place where just everybody's speaking some other language and you don't know what they're talking about? Oh, we're in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> huh? So here are these people from all over the world in the streets of Jerusalem at this festival called Pentecost. And these people are in the streets shouting in some language. 
Some of them understand, but the majority of them can't. And then there's one over there, hey, I hear that one. He's speaking in my native dialect. What's going on? And Peter knows their concern. Peter understands that he, these people must think we're nuts. And somebody says, yeah, they're drunk. No wonder, because they can't understand. It sounds like gibberish. And Peter understands their concern, and he begins with what they're interested in, and what they needed to know. And he tells them, this is what you need to know, and this is what you need to do. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, your message will be one that communicates God's word to people in order to inform them and to change them. That's the message that you have for the world. As God fills you with his Holy Spirit, you'll be sensitive to the needs of those around you. How about your message today? What do people hear when they hear you speak of Christ and the things of God? What are they hearing? Are you using language and stories that reach them and touch the very corners of their heart? It's so important that we desire to reach those around us in a very personal and a very passionate way. And how are we going to do this? Well, Kevin, I'm not the passionate type. Ask God to fill you with his Holy Spirit and he'll give you the passion you need. It'll be his passion. God's word needs to inform them and let them know that change is possible. Study and preparation is important to the how we tell others about Jesus Christ. But that's not all of it. It begins by giving God the opportunity to have part of your life, to have all of your life, so that he can fill you up to overflowing. One of the natural effects of our being filled with the Holy Spirit is that we'll connect with our audience and reach out to them in a passionate way. Now, what is all of this being filled with the Holy Spirit? Doesn't the Holy Spirit live in my heart now that I'm a Christian? Yes. So how can I have more of him? I think the key is not that you get more of God, more of his Holy Spirit, but that he gets more of you. What are you giving to him today that he doesn't have? Do your eyes belong to God? Do your ears belong to God? Do your hands, your heart, your wallet, your life, your job, your relationships, do all of these belong to God? When they're on the altar, God can fill you with his Holy Spirit. Now, is it always what we say? that causes someone to listen, someone to be interested. Francis of Assisi said, preach Jesus at all times, and whenever necessary, use words. Okay? So our lifestyle is very important. How we live provides credibility to our message. What we're saying is not important if our lifestyle doesn't reflect it. If you're living this way and your message says this, what are people going to do? You go, ah, yeah, Jamila preaches a good line there, but, ah, oh, Kevin, yeah, he says this, but look at him. Look at the way he lives. Now, on the day of Pentecost, the apostles brimmed with the experience of the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and they were shouting and worshiping. But their message was based not just on that experience, but on, on the Word of God. It comes from our own experience with Christ. Sure, we tell people, you know, I, before I came to Christ, I was this, and now, you know, God saved me, and this is what I am. And that's good. That's important. But we need to make sure that our message is based on the Word of God. If it's not based on the Word of God, what is it? It's just another story. Peter began to preach to these people and he used the word of God. The church promises joy, peace, love. But is this what people find? Not always. Not always what we find at our churches. But the fact that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit is a proclamation. And it's based on the word of God. Peter preached 
and he pointed to the Old Testament, to Joel, for his foundation. Peter's message is full of scripture. As we live a spirit-filled lives, our lifestyles will not be normal, right? If you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to be like Peter, right? You're going to take a stand with other Christians. You're going to shout to the Lord. You're going to shout the message of God's truth to others. And people are going to want to know why. Are you going to be ready with the word to say, hey, this is what I'm talking about. This is why I'm happy. Romans 5 eight. Let me tell you what it means and why it's important to me. There was a revival early in the year, early in the century, I'm sorry, in, Los, in the Los Angeles area called the Azusa Street Revival. Wild things were going on there. People were getting saved by the hundreds. It didn't matter if they were uh, beggars on the street or the very wealthy. People were getting saved. People were getting healed. Lives were being changed. And the pastor in charge of that fellowship, that revival, Pastor Seymour stated, we are measuring everything that takes place here, every experience, by the Word of God. Every experience must measure up to the Bible. And that's what we need to do. Whenever we experience something, when we're full of the Holy Spirit and we're shouting a song, when we're dancing in front of the Lord, when we're going to church on Sundays and fellowshipping throughout the week with our Christian friends, does what we do stand up to the Word where we be ready to tell our Christian friends, our families, this is why I'm doing this. Does it measure up? Being filled with the Holy Spirit is always centered on Jesus. Jesus is the heart of Peter's sermon. He talks about Jesus' life and death. He talks about his resurrection. Not a comfortable thing for the world. But Peter stood on the word of God. And he stood on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection changes everything, Peter was saying. When Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, he stood up. Though that was not what he was used to doing. Being filled with the Holy Spirit will change your lifestyle. Get ready for that change. You will have a holy boldness like you've never had before. When Peter was filled, he was with his Christian brothers and sisters, and he stood with them. As you are filled with the Holy Spirit, God will put a desire in your heart to be with your Christian brothers and sisters, fellowshipping. You'll look forward to it. When Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, he couldn't help but shout to others the truth of Jesus Christ and the resurrection. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you will look for any chance to talk about Jesus. To your friends, you'll talk to them in a passionate and caring way. You'll be prepared to relate to them and be prepared to answer them regarding your risen Savior. Let me ask you to Read with me one more scripture, and we'll close. Well, Kevin, I, I don't know. I, I'm saved, and that's enough for me. I'm, I'm not too interested in this uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Maybe that's, you know, that's a, one of those Pentecostal, charismatic kind of scary things. I don't want to be, a, you know, too out of control here. Well, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, we'll find that Paul was concerned about the church. Basically, Paul is saying, you're going to be filled with something, and this is what I want you to be filled with. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 says, and Paul, was, Paul knew about this. Paul became a Christian, and a, a few weeks later, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. In verse 18, Paul says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now this is, in the imperative language, this is a command. Christians, don't be filled with things of the world. That's not what you need. You're going to be filled with something, and I want that something to be the Holy Spirit. 
Don't be filled with wine. Don't be filled with the things of the world. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Command from Paul. Let's pray.